What if your next team workshop delivered the results you hoped for? What if everyone believed that the working session was a valuable use of their time and felt inspired to take action? My name is Miriam Hapness, and it is my mission to help you to deliver workshops that work. Today with me on the show is Mai King Tsang. She's a social media FOMO creator and live event reporter. We met last year at the Upreneur Summit in London, and I was fortunate enough to share a table with her at the Mastermind. When I realized that many facilitators advertise their events with pictures of empty flip charts or of piles of post-it notes, I was curious how can we actually create more visibility for our workshops. So that's why I am very excited to have Mike King on the show today to talk about FOMO creation for our workshops. So stay tuned. Hello, Mike King. Hi, how are you? I am very well and I'm excited to have you here in Amsterdam. Thank you so much for inviting me, Miriam. It's been oh. Such a wonderful couple of days. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you came here initially to record the podcast. And then I thought, hmm, since we are talking about FOMO creation for workshops, maybe we should try it firsthand so that then I know what I'm speaking about. <laughs> and I am so grateful for the invitation because I had so much fun. It was such a great new challenge. Unfortunately, We pulled it off. We did really well, didn't we? Yes, yes. <laughs> I cannot complain at all. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. And I like to start with the question of a hashtag. So if you had to choose a hashtag for yourself, what would it be? <laughs> well, I guess... Can it be two? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> so sometimes I would, uh, I'm very honest and open. I really want people to listen to the things that I've done and laugh with me. Mm. So I use the hashtag making mistakes. <laughs> so I'm very, very honest and open about the mistakes that I've made with the hope that people may learn from them so that they don't make them the mistakes. But of course, I don't want all of my social media to be about all the mistakes. I also <laughs> want to show people the successes that I've made too. So the other hashtag is making it happen. <laughs> so great. So great. And actually, the thing that caught my attention in the first place when we met around the table of the mastermind was your brand making tea. <laughs> I just thought it was so genius. <laughs> Miss making is making tea. <laughs> Perfect. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about you making tea and making FOMO <laughs> while making mistakes. Yeah, so I, I did start my business in making tea. So I was selling tea online and I was a very early adopter of social media. So podcast, YouTube, Google+. Plus. Twitter, they were my main platforms. And as I started to get more success for myself, I started to appear on TV and radio and local magazines, national magazines, newspapers and things. Tea companies started to approach me and say, can you do this for our business as well? Mm. And so I went from having my own tea business to being more of a consultant to help other tea businesses. And then with my own social media, I don't just talk about tea. I know that my customers like tea. They like fine dining. They like coffee. They like festivals. They like chefs. And so I would talk about other things like that. And I would go to festivals, food festivals, and I would talk to people and I would taste their food and I would talk about how amazing their food was mm. and this, that and the other. And that's when I started to realize that people were getting excited by the things I was posting And they said, oh, I forgot about this festival. Is it still on? How many more days is there? Mm -hmm. And what I realized is that people were getting FOMO. They were getting mm -hmm. excited with all the posts that I was putting. And then they went to the event themselves and they booked the tickets. So a lot of people were saying to me, you know, you're doing really well here. You're creating excitement and getting people to book tickets onto the next event you should do that more often. Mm. And I don't know about you, Miriam, but I'm not very good at taking compliments. <laughs> <laughs> I realized that. <laughs> so I thought, you know, anybody can do this. Mm. Anybody. 
But I realized, no, not everybody can do it. And when I started to look at the stats, I realized that I was tweeting five, seven, eight times more than anybody else. Mm. And that was when I came up with the title professional live tweeter Mm. and FOMO creator. And that's where it stemmed from, really. Awesome. So it's your very clear, unfair advantage. (laughs) And um, just a side note for anyone who might be confused or doesn't know the word FOMO, (laughs) which stands for the fear of missing out. Yeah. And we just had this event. So you came over to report about the mastermind that I set up. And you created not only FOMO at the event, but you even started before that. So you created (laughs) pre-FOMO. So the fear of missing out before even having started. And I would love to hear from you what you've done and why you did it. So, you know, I... I'm so thrilled that we got the chance to talk to each other and to work with each other. Because when we were at the Mastermind, if you remember, we got involved in a a conversation and I think you taught me something and I taught you something Mm -hmm. and you were so thrilled. And that's why you invited me to be a guest on your podcast. And those moments like that where you learn from somebody, I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the pre-FOMO was because I really was so excited to come to Amsterdam, the thought of working with you, and I just wanted to tell the world about it. Now, there's a reason why I'm doing that. So the pre-FOMO is to get excited, to tell the world that I'm coming to Amsterdam, to tell the world that I am working with the amazing Dr. Miriam Hadness, <laughs> to tell the world that I am working on something quite new, which mm. is to create FOMO, not on my favorite platform. I love Twitter. I'm very good at Twitter. I'm scared of Twitter. <laughs> It's too fast for me. A lot of people are. A lot of people are. But if you do Twitter in a particular focused way and strategic way, it doesn't need to be as noisy as it is. Mm-hmm. But you were asking me to create FOMO on Instagram. And I thought, great. I was so excited because I've just started to get into Instagram. I wanted to know whether I could create FOMO for you on Instagram and just see how it worked. And it definitely worked. So that's why I pre-FOMO'd for you, because I was excited to uh, the prospect of working with you, excited to come to Amsterdam, excited at the challenge of creating Mm. FOMO on Instagram. But it's really to spread the word about what you do for facilitators so that if anybody was looking on Instagram, they searched on the hashtag workshops work, or they searched on the hashtag facilitators, then hopefully they'll see all these posts about your up and coming event. Mm -hmm. And then they may sign up to it as a last minute person. Mm -hmm. That's why I created pre-FOMO. Great. And fortunately, I didn't have any places left (laughs) for last minute signups. And it was actually amazing for me to witness how you started actually creating this buzz around the event from the moment that your feet touched Amsterdam ground. (laughs) (laughs) And then you explained during the event in the keynote you gave that not every post that you created was directly related to the mastermind event, but you also created just some insights about your experience being in Amsterdam. That's exactly right. So, I mean, the title of your mastermind is how to create visibility for events beyond a picture of an empty flip chart. Mm. And that's the thing. Everyone talks about the empty flip chart or the post-it notes. This is my facilitator mastermind. If you'd like to come, this is what you're going to learn. And that's boring. (laughs) All of that is boring. (laughs) You know, if, I mean, if you've never seen an Mm -hmm. empty flip chart before, great. But because they're, they are there all the time, it's boring. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was doing. I was demonstrating how to do something a bit more creatively so that your facilitators will also understand, ah, okay, that's how you can create new social media content. So when I arrived As I said, we got off the the station. What was the name of the train? Slotterdijk. Slotterdijk. And 
I was just overwhelmed with the number of bicycles Mm. and it was great. So, you know, so I did a little Instagram story about how I've just arrived in Amsterdam. So that's a soft sell to explain that I'm here for Amsterdam Mm -hmm. with Miriam. So again, people know, oh, okay, making is working with Miriam. And then I'm doing something creative by saying, and I've just come across all these bicycles. How do people actually find their bicycle Mm -hmm. and you know when I did that Instagram story I had about six or seven people send me a private message Mm. and they said some of them said what are you doing in Amsterdam so I explained Mm. some of them said how do people find their bicycles (laughs) (laughs) so I explained and that is where the engagement happens. Mm. And so I can, ex- you know, it's giving me an invitation to talk to people about what it is I do. If I'd have just written, just arrived in Amsterdam, I'm just about to get ready for a facilitator's uh, mastermind that's happening tomorrow, I probably wouldn't have got as much engagement. And I wouldn't have got so many page and profile views without even being engaged myself because I don't remember having taken out my phone a single time in the beginning because I was just so excited and when I then checked I had new followers I had new profile views (laughs) although I didn't do anything myself (laughs) and that was because I tagged you in it exactly yeah. yeah exactly so you know when when you're running a facilitator's workshop if you know some of the attendees who are mm. coming ask their permission first of course and if you've got their permission to use their name on the social media then you can talk about that yeah. and that's where you can get FOMO and raise awareness about what you do and they might also be proud to be associated with the event and show publicly that they're investing in themselves by joining a mastermind. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I think that that's really, really important. When you uh, run a business or you're a freelancer or even when you're working for somebody, we all have a personal brand and we all need to be proud of what it is we do. Mm -hmm. And we want to associate ourselves with other successful personal brands. So, you know, I tagged Dr. Miriam Hadness because she is amazing. She's got this great niche where she's helping facilitators to thrive and grow in a safe haven of a lovely venue so we can share problems, we can share our successes. I want to be a part of that. Mm. So that's why I tagged you because I'm proud to be part of, you know, be associated with your brand. Yeah. And I want to underline the fact or what you just said that it's important to get the consent first. Yes. Because I also experienced that sometimes, and we talked about it yes. um, maybe yesterday, that there are some free riders, let's call them free riders, <laughs> who would just randomly tag us to be associated or in a post that has nothing to do with us. That's right. Um, yep. And I was always wondering, how can I protect myself against that? Yeah. And unfortunately, yeah. you can't. So I get a lot of people who tag me and... If they haven't got my permission, I'll just not talk to them. But if they have my permission, then I will engage with them. And if Mm -hmm. I engage with them, that increases the chances of their post being seen by more people. Yeah, with your almost 10,000 followers, right? (laughs) That's That's impressive. (laughs) I could see the impact of of that. So we talked about the pre-FOMO, which was for me exciting because it was something that I didn't even expect and haven't thought of, at least in this extent and format. What happened then at the event? What happened at the event? Well, I thought that I would experiment. And so because we were going to be using Instagram primarily for FOMO, I thought that I would still record the presentation that I was going to deliver on Twitter, Mm -hmm. just so that people could see what it is I was doing. And so in the talk itself, I wanted to help people to understand what we are doing with the FOMO and why we are doing it. Mm. So in the talk itself, I mentioned about you can create FOMO on Instagram, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Facebook. What you need to do to try and engage with the people who are here today is to search for the hashtag. Mm. So search for the hashtag workshops work to see if people are talking about it. Because a lot of people who attend an event, 
they will have tweeted or they will have Instagrammed or they will have uh, Facebooked or LinkedIn and said, I'm just going to London for the Upreneur Summit or I'm just arriving at Miriam Hadness's Workshops Work conference. Mm-hmm. And so you want to engage with those people. So in the first part of the presentation, I talked about how you search for the hashtag, which then I believe, Miriam, you were saying that some people... For them, that was a really golden piece of information. Because For me, it was. <laughs> For me, it was because I didn't even realize until then that I could use the hashtag workshops work as my brand hashtag. Right. I unconsciously did it, Yes. but I never used it strategically. So yes. when you dropped this information, I was like, oh. <laughs> So the light bulb moment went off. Absolutely, yeah. In 37 degrees, (laughs) adding some more heat. (laughs) So yeah, so I explained about how you can search for your hashtag. And if you don't have one, think of one Mm. and create it and use it. Because going forward, when you run more workshops in the future, people might want to do a bit of homework. And they may think, Yes, I think I might be interested in going to your next workshop, but I want to know what your workshops were like in the past. Mm -hmm. So they can search on workshops work or your own branded hashtag and look at what's happened in the past. And then they get all the first-hand testimonials as well because the people who attended will talk about it and then you'll see the truth and not only what is put on the website exactly exactly Mm. yes as long as they use the hashtag of course of course yeah Yeah. so we talked about that and then what I also did because I really wanted you know I do a lot of presentations up and down the country uh, around the world and I really wanted to customize this presentation especially for facilitators so the next thing I talked about was how do I increase visibility, you know, Mm -hmm. beyond the empty flip chart that I talked about. So on LinkedIn, what I did was I created, we went out for some dinner, didn't we, Mm -hmm. when I arrived. Mm -hmm. So after the amazing bicycles that we saw everywhere at the train station, we had a quick walk, we went for a beer, we realized that both of us like La La Chouf, and we had a beer, you know, we raised a toast to each other, and I wrote about it. So I wrote about it on, actually, I wrote about it on Instagram because Instagram, I can't quite remember how many characters you've got, but I know it's more than 1,300 Mm. anyway. So I wrote this long list, arrived in Amsterdam, excited, had a a bottle of La Chouf with uh, Miriam. We also had some traditional food as well. Mm -hmm. What was the... um, The Bitterbollen. Bitterbollen, that's right which was amazing. And we also discussed about the workshop, what it was going to look like. And that was when I was thrilled with the challenge of creating FOMO for Instagram. So I wrote all about this on an Instagram post. I tagged Miriam because I wanted her to see it. I also added the hashtag workshops work so that it's recorded. And so if ever anybody wanted to search on that hashtag in the future, they will see this post. And then I also tagged Jerome, the Mm. uh, fabulous photographer, Mm. because I also wanted him to know as well. And I was going to meet him the next day. So I wrote all this. I then copied all of the text and I pasted it into LinkedIn because in social media, things have changed. You can create one post and you can actually copy and paste it on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Twitter, on different social media applications. Mm -hmm. And we all don't have a lot of time. So, you know, having one piece of information which we can share across different platforms is fantastic. Mm. Now, we didn't do that two years ago. So things have changed. So two years ago, social media experts were saying, you know, Facebook is very different to Twitter. It's very different to Instagram. You have to do different things on each one. But now, two years on, we can use the same thing or just change the word slightly. What has changed? Just because I think what experts have realized is that we don't have a lot of time. Mm. And in reality, people do want to know who we are. You know, LinkedIn, the algorithm has changed so that people want to see more about us as a human as opposed to more about us as a business. Mm -hmm. So LinkedIn used to be very formal. 
Mm-hmm. It used to be about, yeah. you know, business, business cards. This is what I'm doing. But now, you know, with LinkedIn, you can put in emojis, you can put mm. in videos, you can even put in gifts if you want to. <laughs> so LinkedIn is trying to become more human. And so that's why the algorithm changed so that you can put the same post across every social media platform. And also, I think Facebook might have changed because what I realized over the last 10 years that it used to be the younger generation being on Facebook. Yes. And now we grew up and we're still on Facebook. Yes. And there are more and more parents on Facebook. So their children eventually leave. Yes. So Facebook also becomes more of a working people platform. So a professional Exactly right. That's exactly right. Yes, the things have changed over time, like you said, and, you know, the younger folk are going on to Instagram or they're going on to Snapchat. Mm -hmm. But yeah, a lot of people are still on Facebook, the older generation. So yeah. Yeah. So if your target market is, you know, 30 to 50, then you may want to focus more attention on Mm -hmm. uh, Facebook or Instagram because a lot of people are on Instagram too. So I was just explaining in the presentation that I had one piece of information which I shared on Instagram. I copied and pasted it into LinkedIn. LinkedIn, you're only allowed 1,200 characters. So I can normally speak for England. (laughs) So I edited a little bit, but the same pictures, the picture of the shoof, the what were the snacks called again the bitter bollen bitter bollen and yeah so i put that onto linkedin and then i also posted it onto twitter as well and twitter Mm -hmm. you've got 280 characters so what i did was created seven tweets Mm. that was part of the same conversation so i was just demonstrating how you can do that for yourself for your workshops as well so not only did i write something that was different to an empty flip chart, but I also used it in three different places. Mm -hmm. And that's what I talked about. Before we continue the show, let me take a brief moment to thank our sponsor, Session Lab. Are you using Excel or Word to prepare and schedule your workshops? Try something that is designed for facilitators. With an easy-to-use drag-and-drop agenda builder, Session Lab allows you to be free and creative in your workshop process design. Session Lab also comes with an immense built-in library of workshop activities and facilitation techniques to help you to find new inspiration for your sessions. Stop messing with spreadsheets and focus on designing engaging workshops. Try it as sessionlab.com. I wouldn't recommend it if I didn't believe in its value myself. So, and you talked about the different platforms And you mentioned a little bit that the algorithm of LinkedIn changed. So when we do take more time or if we want to be more strategic, what would be the differences of the different approaches on the three different platforms being Instagram, LinkedIn and Facebook? What a great question. And Twitter. And Twitter, (laughs) my favorite platform. Um, So LinkedIn is actually, the algorithm is very similar to the Facebook algorithm. And people are using the strategy on LinkedIn that they used on Facebook five years ago. So we want more people to see our post. And so I am actually a member of two WhatsApp groups. Mm -hmm. And in the WhatsApp group, people will say, hey, guys, I have just put a LinkedIn post on LinkedIn. Can you like, can you comment, can you share? And within the first hour, if you comment, like, and share on your LinkedIn post, LinkedIn will think, ah, people find this really useful. Mm -hmm. So therefore, they will show it to more people. And so this approach used to be adopted in Facebook. And so that's what people are doing now. Now, for me personally, going back to the branding we were talking about, Mm -hmm. I only really want to like and comment on someone's post if I find it relevant to my Mm -hmm. readers or if I found something useful about it. If I've read it and I don't think I want to be associated with that particular post, because some posts people put on LinkedIn are controversial. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people swear, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's okay, but it's just not for me. Mm -hmm. So I will not comment and share and like everything that other people put up there. I will carefully consider Mm -hmm. it. But a lot of people, just because they want more people to see their name 
And I understand that they want their uh, people to see more, uh, their name. They want LinkedIn to increase the number of people that see the post, then they will comment on it. Mm. So that used to happen five years ago on Facebook. And I think that's very interesting because I always thought that on LinkedIn, I would rather wait a little bit before commenting on someone mentioning me because then I don't want to spam them. So they put a post, then my name is in the algorithm. And then I thought, oh, cool. So I'm going to wait for a few hours and then my name will pop up again. And now I learned that it's actually exactly the opposite, which yeah. is true that I should, I must, if I want to be more around, comment right away. And also if you want to, you know, help your friend who yeah. tagged you as well. So yeah, absolutely. Now I also used to think like yourself as well, because on Twitter, We may not want to respond immediately mm -hmm. because we want the tweet to last a little bit longer. Mm. And also Twitter is not the main platform for a lot of people. So we were talking this morning, Miriam, mm -hmm. about how, you know, you, you're getting a lot of mentions at the moment because I've been tagging you. I feel so overwhelmed. <laughs> And I understand that a lot of people mm -hmm. do feel overwhelmed. So I was explaining to you this morning, don't worry, just set five minutes aside once a week Mm. to go into Twitter to see who's been talking about you or talking to you. Reply to those and do nothing else. That's all mm. you need to do, just for five minutes, just to get used to it. This calms my mind a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and with Instagram, you know, it's a, a similar thing where, you know, people are posting. The posts tend to last longer mm -hmm. uh, with the algorithm on Instagram than Twitter and LinkedIn. So again, don't feel under pressure to comment or to like and share, but do make sure that if anyone is talking to you, do respond. You don't have to respond mm -hmm. immediately, but do make sure you check once a week if it's not your main platform, just to see if anyone's talking to you and then respond back. It's just the nicest thing and the most human mm -hmm. thing to do, really. So if you say that a post lasts longer on Instagram than on LinkedIn, this would mean that maybe one post per day or every two days on Instagram is okay, whereas in on LinkedIn, you may want to post more often. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I often get asked, you know, how often do you post on uh, on Instagram? How often should you post on uh, LinkedIn? And the thing is, is that your readers will tell you, mm. you know, if you find that you haven't posted on Instagram for five days and then you suddenly post and you're getting lots of comments, mm. then that means that five days is okay. Mm -hmm. But if you have not posted for 10 days and then you don't get as many comments, then you know, ah, okay. I pissed off someone. <laughs> So you need to think, oh, okay, maybe I need to post more frequently than five days, between five and 10, but you have to experiment yourself. Now on Instagram, there are four audiences. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've only talked really about Instagram posts, mm -hmm. what we did today, but I got talking to an influencer expert, Neil Schaefer, and he recommended that I do a bit more on Instagram and definitely on Instagram stories. So on Instagram stories, if I have something useful to say, I will try and post that every day, but I don't put pressure on myself. If I feel today, I don't have anything useful to say, mm. then I won't. So that's, that's the other thing as well. Yeah. Don't so, spam your audience. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And talking about the Instagram stories and coming back to the event and the FOMO you created, because I think there's so much to learn from that. So the most scary part of all of that, and it really scared me a lot, to say the least, <laughs> was that we agreed that you will use my phone throughout the event <laughs> so that I can really concentrate on the time boxing and making sure that the energy stays up despite sauna-like temperatures <laughs> um, here in Amsterdam and really make sure that um, all the tables are okay and maybe also just listening and seeing um, where the groups are at. So you used my phone to create Instagram stories and I only checked the day after and was amazed how you could just grab some insights from what happened without 
intruding in this rather intimate atmosphere of a mastermind table. So maybe you can guide us through and why it's important that you used my phone. Yeah. And I, again, I'm so grateful that I was invited to take up this challenge because at the start of the presentation, you did talk about the facilitator's mastermind where we are sharing ideas. No one is judging anybody else. Everything is safe in these four walls. Mm -hmm. So my personal challenge was how am I able to create FOMO when such intimate subjects mm -hmm. are going to be talked about? And I also didn't want to sit next to the facilitators to listen into the subjects because mm -hmm. even though you mentioned at the start of the presentation, you said that, you know, making might be sharing sub subjects, but she won't be sharing any names. Mm -hmm. Okay. So all names are protected. I still felt like I might have intruded if I'd have sat next mm -hmm. to a facilitator and listened in. So it was a personal challenge to me. How can I create FOMO without talking about the topics that were discussed? Mm -hmm. So I looked at it from a holistic viewpoint. And what I noticed was a lot of things. So one of the things that I noticed was that there were three tables. One table, they had decided amongst themselves that they would pair up. Mm -hmm. So they talked in pairs and then at the last 10 minutes, they would share what everyone had mm. talked about. And then another table, they decided they would just have one person speak and then everyone else would share their words of wisdom. So it's just little things like that that mm. I noticed. And then I also noticed that sometimes I could hear the same words coming up. This is great. This is great advice. You know, there is connection, the importance of safe space, a safe space. And so all these key words were popping up. So I shared about that mm -hmm. as well. And then, of course, we also had uh, Jerome, the photographer, who was just getting set up. So I took photographs of that and commented on that. He mm -hmm. was just getting set up, getting ready, making sure that he didn't upset anybody in, you know, in the big space. You know, so I was just observing and mm. commenting on that and what impact that your workshop had on people. And you could see, you could feel the energy. Mm. I really wanted to convey the positive energy as well in the Instagram stories. Yeah, yeah and um, you asked the participants in the beginning to just add their tag from Instagram on a flip chart so that you could also then tag them along the yes, way yes yes that's a, right yeah yeah so that was great as well so when I was doing the Instagram stories I was able to tag some of the participants so that they could also see the stories the next day as well so yeah I did that as well forgot about that actually <laughs> yeah yeah that was a nice nice add-on yes um, and helped you along the way obviously of course yeah of course I can only speak for myself in terms of the results that I saw coming through the FOMO and I mentioned before that I got many more profile views than normally and people would start liking my or your stories and maybe I should mention that before the event took place so in the morning I posted on LinkedIn and on Instagram that I will put my phone and my trust into your hands <laughs> so that everyone knows that I'm not talking to them directly but through you yes. on that event so that was a challenge <laughs> And a nice experiment. And I'm very happy that we did it because I'm still getting now more traction and I can see that even older posts that are liked. When you go to other events or when you maybe advertise yourself, what is usually the result that you would hope for that you would bring forth? So it depends on the client, really. So, you know, for us, You know, we wanted to ensure that the facilitator, it was all about the facilitators. It mm -hmm. wasn't about you. Mm -hmm. It was all about the facilitators. So we knew that we wanted to give them as much publicity as possible. That was our goal. So, you know, when you talked about on Instagram stories that I was going to take over your stories to help people understand that, you know, this is who I am, what I do. And we tagged all of the facilitators That's what we were doing. We were, mm. we were honoring that goal of making it about your facilitators. With other clients, their goal was to ensure that they sold tickets mm. for the next conference. So again, I was taking over 
one of my clients is Andrew and Pete. They had a, an amazing conference in Newcastle. They asked me to take over their Instagram and also their Twitter and also their Facebook. So I did exactly that. But their goal was to ensure that we had tickets sold for the next conference. Mm. So I was tweeting lots. I was Instagramming lots. I was doing Facebook interviews live had a lot of fun and the end goal was that we managed to sell 450 tickets mm-hmm. for a conference for next year awesome and so it worked it definitely worked yes and i'm very pleased because they enjoyed my work so much they've hired me for next year congratulations thank Yay. you so it depends on the client what their goal is mm-hmm. so it could be their goal is look, I haven't done this before. I just want to raise awareness about what we are doing. Mm. So that's absolutely possible. And then there are some people whose goal is, I want to sell tickets Mm -hmm. for next year. Mm -hmm. And so we honor that goal. So different clients have different requirements, basically. And I like that you underline that at the Mastermind event, it wasn't about me, but it was about the participants. Yes. And I think this made not only me feel more comfortable. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and I think it not only made me more f- comfortable, but it was also a way to have a soft promotion of the event, because I think nobody's interested in me. Okay, Miriam is launching a mastermind event. That's fantastic for her. So what? But honoring the guests and giving them the opportunity also to self-promote and to be in the spotlight then it becomes more interesting also for the outside world because they see firsthand what would be in for them by joining the next. Absolutely. And, And I think that was what was really powerful about this mastermind, giving the facilitators the opportunity to understand what they can do mm. for their workshops going forward. Yeah. And, it, you know, in the mastermind, you had not only freelancers who worked for themselves, but you also had people who worked for corporate companies. Mm-hmm. And for corporates, they possibly don't want to share that they're facilitating workshops outside onto social media. Mm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So how are they going to promote the fact that they are doing it? Yeah. Well, they can do it on their intranet, you know, or they can do it via email or they can talk to other departments and say, yeah. this is what we've done recently and they can share their knowledge. So there's absolutely lots of opportunities for facilitators to give themselves promotion yeah. either out onto social media or within the internet or the organization. And so in the mastermind, because we made it about them, hopefully they were able to see, ah, this is why we did Mm pre-FOMO. Ah, this is why we, you know, put all of our names on the flip chart. Mm -hmm. Ah, this is why we asked permission. Is it okay that we can talk about you on social Mm -hmm. media, et cetera? Yeah. And it's a very important point that you just rose Thank you for reminding me about the corporate facilitators. Yes. Because it was only through our conversations we had that I realized how strong this instrument of FOMO or life reporting, social media reporting, or however we want to call it, is also for corporates. Because very often what I hear from those who facilitate within companies is they have a workshop and it might generate new ideas and excitement. But then very quickly, the participants Monday morning, they're back to their daily routine. Yes. But if the facilitator introduces a way to create FOMO, to create traction, even if it's only, as you said, through the intranet or the internal communication platforms, this can not only help them to share their results throughout the departments, to get the buy-in maybe from others to create some engagement, some conversation, and also keep those who are in the workshop more enthusiastic to follow up. Also, it creates actually visibility and accountability because they might be asked, oh, so what have you done since the workshop? Absolutely. And <laughs> peer also, pressure. Absolutely, peer pressure it is. But also from a public relations perspective as well, you know, the corporates could actually write a LinkedIn post mm. and say that this is what we did. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and to the outside world, it shows that 
this is a forward thinking company that mm. they are willing to invest in their employees, willing to invest some time in actually listening to them, create these facilitating mm. workshops and sharing ideas, which they can then share with other departments. So, you know, the, the PR mm. can actually be done as one LinkedIn post and then all the participants for their own personal branding they can then write comments and say it was a great workshop this, you know we learned so much and this that and the other because the employees potentially you know they may think well I've got a career here for 10 years but I may decide to move on mm. or I may look for another company or I may start by myself and so they need to think about their own public relations mm. and their own branding and so they could potentially write a LinkedIn post for themselves mm. but it also gives great PR for the corporate yeah. as well. Yeah true and on LinkedIn we see this a lot already. Yes. Um, how they share. I usually ask the question what makes workshops fail and with you uh, in front of <laughs> me um, who might not be so familiar with workshops but maybe more with conferences I would like to just broaden the question <laughs> to at least give you the choice and permission <laughs> so according to you when you're at a workshop or at a conference what from an outside perspective and I think that's very interesting I'm very curious to hear that <laughs> what does make it fail Well, I mean, my job title is FOMO creator, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for a conference organizer or for a workshop facilitator, it's very important to look after the people that have come to your event. Mm -hmm. I understand that. But what about the opportunity to help facilitators who couldn't get to that event, who are wanting to know more information about the next event or the next conference? And so you are doing the whole wide world a disservice mm -hmm. if you don't talk about that, mm -hmm. if you don't create that FOMO and place it onto social media or on the intranet or internal communications. Mm. So that is an epic fail because your workshop is so amazing. It touched the hearts and minds of all 14 participants yesterday in that workshop. So wouldn't it be nice if when you run this event again, mm. that other people get to take part in it? Yeah. So if you don't create FOMO, mm -hmm. then you're missing out. Yeah. So I totally get your point. And I think it's a good reminder. I was thinking about at an event. Yes. So you might have attended a conference either privately or yes. professionally, as you do a lot. That's how we met. Or yes. as a FOMO creator. Yes. When would you say that a conference is a failure, that you didn't get or the participants didn't get what they expected? So, you know, I think the a conference or a workshop, the whole idea is that it's a great educational experience. It's a great networking experience. And so if you don't get good speakers, if you don't give the opportunities for people to network, Mm -hmm. I consider that a fail. Mm -hmm. So in one of the conferences, I won't mention which one, mm -hmm. obviously, <laughs> but in one of the conferences, I wanted to network with other people and the organizer didn't give that opportunity. Mm. You know, they didn't say, oh, hey, we're just meeting up at this particular pub at seven o'clock. Would love you to join us. They mm. didn't do that. And if they didn't do that, then... That's a missed opportunity for people mm -hmm. to network, to get to know other people. Because sometimes, you know, some people go to a conference on their own, mm -hmm. but they're so scared. You know, we were talking about being an introvert and an extrovert, and I am sometimes an introvert. Sometimes I'm an extrovert. And there was one particular uh, time I went to a conference and I was so shy I was such an introvert. There was just too much energy in the room. I nearly wanted to run away. Mm -hmm. I can relate to that. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was so lucky because someone spotted me and they recognized me. And I didn't know that they knew me, which was amazing. <laughs> and they came all the way over to say, hey, making, how are you? And that made me feel so much better. Mm. But a conference, if they don't have those opportunities mm -hmm. to network, then I feel that the conference organizers are not looking after mm -hmm. the introverts who it's already a big deal 
for them yeah. to come to an event. Yeah, I remember at the conference where we met, I think for the entire first day, I didn't talk to anyone Oh, because I just started my business. I was so scared. I was so overwhelmed. I thought that everyone was professional. But yeah. me. <laughs> and like, who, who could, people would ask me, so what do you do? And I got so scared. Oh. They just blanked. They didn't even know how to describe myself. <laughs> so that was a challenge. I can relate to that too. <laughs> yeah. And then even now, the, when going back, when we met in London again in May, I walked into this venue and first I thought that maybe it's a wrong venue because I didn't know anyone. I didn't see any branded posts. And then you recognized me and started talking to me and we had this amazing chat. And I was like, okay, after these 10 minutes, I can already go home because I got so many insights <laughs> that all the rest is just a bonus. Yeah. And yeah, I think to help participants to connect beforehand to facilitate the space actually even if it's just an informal drinking thing the day before I think that's very valuable yeah definitely and I've seen many conferences do this really well mm -hmm. through a Facebook group mm -hmm. where in the Facebook group they will say hey, we're just going to hang out in this pub, this restaurant the day before. I just want to get numbers. Is anybody interested? Would you like to meet? And so that's great because mm. it gives people an opportunity to say, yes, I will be there. Yeah. And on the next day, hopefully the organizers have written a poster to say, this is where we are meeting so mm. that we know that we are meeting there. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's really important. And then to come back to the FOMO, this even helps the conference host to get more visibility because these people, as soon as they meet, they have something to talk about, they want to share it, then yes. they will use the hashtag, Absolutely. tag each other. Absolutely. So it's actually even mutually beneficial to create space for participants Definitely. to connect because Definitely. they have at least one thing in common, yes. which is the conference or the workshop, and they will most surely talk about that exactly yeah. that's exactly right huh <laughs> thank you for teaching me that <laughs> i learned so much <laughs> great so we talked about pre-fomo and fomo and as a last question i would be interested in post-fomo post-fomo amazing so how do you keep people engaged and you mentioned that on twitter it makes sense to delay the answer in order to quote keep the tweet alive for yes. longer yes <laughs> so what can we do if we have a workshop and then we wrote this one post and get all the testimonials or feedback hopefully and then what <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, one of the things that I like to do is actually gather a report, create a report. Mm -hmm. So I'm not normally a numbers person, but I'm trying to get better at that. So I actually have a couple of reports that I will bring down based on the hashtag. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a branded hashtag, I will search on that just to see how many people were talking about it, who were the top speakers, the top tweeters, the top, top engagers, and how we can maintain the FOMO afterwards is we can maybe say, hey, thank you so much for coming. Mm -hmm. What was your biggest takeaway? Mm -hmm. And ask them, you know, is there anything else that you, you know, we would love some feedback. Mm -hmm. Have you got any constructive feedback that you'd like to give us? And that enables you to have a conversation and keep that conversation going. And would you do this on social media or in a survey? You can do both. Mm -hmm. You can absolutely do do both because some people will love to give you feedback but they don't want to show it publicly mm -hmm. on social media so you give them the opportunity to either complete the survey or send you a private email or send you a private message something like that mm -hmm. we also talked about you know on the day of the event what I try to do was to do interviews with people and if the interviews have been done well <laughs> which I made a mistake and there was so much excitement in the room. The microphone didn't pick up the interview, but we're we working on that. We underestimated the background now. We did. We learned for next time. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, because of the excitement in the room, which is great, we did the interviews. You could use those interviews as, you know, and drip feed them into social media. 
you know, and get sound bites mm. from the interviews and you can post those along the way. Mm. You know, one of the interviews that I did early this year was about how to create FOMO on Twitter. And during the podcast, there were a few bloopers. <laughs> so Janet, Janet Murray, she interviewed me and uh, one of her family members popped to the loo. So there was a toilet flush. <laughs> So she kept that and posted that after the podcast interview as a blooper. So it keeps the conversation going. It's so cool. And then there was one time where uh, my mum's got hay fever, really bad hay fever at the moment. So she sneezed mm. and Janet said, oh, is that your dog? And I said, no, it's my <laughs> mum. <laughs> so that was a blooper. And so mm. she shared that maybe a week after mm-hmm. the podcast. So, you know, Maybe there were funny moments in mm-hmm. your in your workshop, you know, that you can share post FOMO, mm-hmm. and that's again, it's that soft sell, mm-hmm. and you know, you can send out the Instagram post. This is our blooper, or this is a funny picture, or something like that. Yeah. And if you would like to know more details, you can sign up to my newsletter, and that's how you can create the conversation yeah. and keep yeah. it going. Yeah, very nice, and I'm excited to see how it will work with hours where we so Jeroen as you mentioned he took beautiful headshot pictures oh, of the so participants beautiful. yeah so I asked them whether they would be willing to to agree that I share their pictures with a quote about the about the mastermind right and put it on social media because I thought it might be easier for me to post a beautiful picture of them because I can only speak about myself but even if I have a fantastic picture of myself that I like, I maybe I wouldn't put it on on social media <laughs> just to say, hey, look how beautiful I am. <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I would just change my profile picture, but it's not something that I would do. So I thought giving them the chance to show how pretty, how beautiful they are. Yeah. And then, yeah, still keeping the and again, post-FOMO life. A- again, there's two recurring themes here that... It's demonstrating again, it's not about you, Miriam. Mm. It's about the facilitators. It's about the participants of that workshop. So by you consciously, you know, receiving that photograph Mm. and putting in a caption, asking permission. So again, you're being consistent. Mm -hmm. That is just another way of extending that FOMO, but you're doing it consistently because you ask permission. You also want to make it about them. You know, you want them to associate their brand with your Mm. amazing brand. So it's all these lovely themes that are coming through and it's all consistent and it's great. That's what you're doing, basically. Since we're coming to the end of our interview... And maybe a dear listener fell asleep after minute one, just woke up and thought, oh my goodness, I don't have time to listen to all of that again. What do you want this person to remember? Oh, the one thing to remember, that you're not alone. You know, sometimes being in business, being a facilitator can often feel like the loneliest place on the planet, but it doesn't need to be because you have masterminds like this to come to, to share your experience, to receive help from other facilitators and to also share the connection, the love in the room, the knowledge and the experience. So you're not alone. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now it feels like an advertisement break for myself. (laughs) So the show was not only about the mastermind, how great it was. We talked a lot about FOMO, so if you just woke up, it is worth your time to just take a approximately hour and to learn a lot from making <laughs> it happen. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time making. Thank you so it much for It was lovely me. to have you here, and I hope to see you soon again for more FOMO and more masterminding. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.work to download the one-page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day.